Well, um, this is Chief Jane Caster. Um, she's an incredibly inspiring woman, not just for her health accomplishments that she made, but for how she carried them out. Just a few of Chief Caster's accomplishments include her 31-year career at the Tampa Police Department, during which she became the first woman to lead the TPD. As Chief, she introduced a new crime reduction strategy that focused on building relationships between the community and her police force. Since its introduction in 2003, Chief Caster's strategy has reduced the crime rate in Tampa by 70%. Along with her numerous law enforcement accomplishments, Chief Caster has led multiple efforts to help Tampa's disadvantaged children. Some of these efforts include opening a new gym at the Police Athletic League that now serves 300 at-risk youth. In addition, her department has opened the rich Resources and Community Hope House, which serves as a safe haven for at-risk kids in Tampa by providing various resources such as mentoring and after-school programs. Chief Caster has also improved the training of her officers by introducing courses on protecting people's rights and, tra and training centered on recognizing and overcoming biases in order to maintain a fair and impartial policing practices. There are many more accomplishments that I have not touched on, so without further ado, please help me in welcoming Chief Caster. be a little uh, interactive here. Now clearly I've been a police officer for 31 years, which is longer than you guys have, uh, have been on the earth. So my uh, slant may be towards law enforcement. But I want to kind of give you our side of it and then uh, open up to questions and things. And trust me, if you don't ask questions, then I'll, uh, I'll pick on you, okay? Now if you look at law enforcement in our uniform, we are the most visible arm of government. And as such, we oftentimes take the brunt of, of everyone's anger at government. You know, if the roads aren't working right, traffic's not moving, um, all of those types of issues, you can always take it out on a police officer because you know that that represents uh, city government. And public perception of law enforcement is something that's very unique. If you look at any of the studies that have been done on individuals' uh, perception of different professions, for example, the medical profession, if a doctor does something egregious, say they, they kill one of their patients, public perception of the medical field stays very high. They just think this guy probably shouldn't be a doctor. If you look at public perception of law enforcement, it looks like an EKG chart. Something happens in Ferguson, and every police officer in the nation is blamed for that action. There is a police officer on duty in the United States that hasn't gotten the statement, oh, you're just like everybody from Ferguson. It's something to do with the incident that occurred out there. So as such, public perception of law enforcement is up and down, up and down. The police officer gets killed in the line of duty. Everybody loves police officers. Something happens where a police officer does something egregious and kills someone, then all police officers get blamed for that. Now there's close to 700,000 police officers in the United States. And the vast majority of police departments have less than 100 police officers. And there are places, for example, I'm doing some work with Flint, Michigan right now, they have no training program. They have no training for their officers whatsoever. Their city's actually in bankruptcy. So, but yet, their actions would be something that would reflect on the Tampa Police Department that is an organization that is very, very well respected, has a thousand police officers, and we do everything that we can to ensure that, that our officers are working closely with the community. Not to say that these other ones aren't, but they may not get that day-to-day -day training. Now, here's another, uh, do anybody have relatives that are firefighters? All right, I love firefighters. I'm gonna go on record and say I love firefighters. Everybody loves firefighters. You know, firefighters can show up late, building burns down, and everybody's like, well, you tried, and let me go make you an apple pie. And look at police officers, when do we get called? We get called when there's a disagreement, and we're called in to mediate that, decide who's right, who's wrong, uh, right people, traffic citations, those types of things. So we automatically irritate about half the people that we deal with out there in the community. So it's, it's very, very important that we are working with the community and understanding who it is that we're policing. 
And when I say that, it's not just the community at, at large, it's the neighborhoods where the officers are at. They need to know the people in that neighborhood and they need to know what the issues are in that neighborhood because they vary. Some neighborhoods, like I always say, uh, in uh, some neighborhoods in Tampa, uh, crime prevention is, could somebody please lock a car door and close your garage at night? And other neighborhoods is, get a pit bull and a shotgun. You know, there's differences in the neighborhoods and in the community, and the officers need to know that. Now, let's get to human perception. Your perception is your reality, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is with humans. There's, again, there's not a police officer on earth that hasn't pulled a car over for running a red light, walked up to the driver, and the driver says, you pulled me over because, fill in the blank, because I'm white, because I'm black, because I'm a male, because I'm a female. It's like, well, really, I pulled you over because you ran the red light. And the reality of it is, is that very rarely does an officer know who's in the car until they walk up to that door. So, but again, it's your perception. And that's why that interaction between the officer and the citizen is so very, very important. It's vital. And it's one of the things that we train our officers in the Tampa Police Department. I swore in, I was a police chief for almost six years, and I swore every brand new officer in personally. And what they heard from me the day they raised their arm and took the oath of office was that the golden rule of the Tampa Police Department was that everyone, everyone was treated with dignity and respect. There was no exception to that rule. And if that rule was violated, they would be dealt with very harshly. And that is so important, again, in law enforcement. Because studies show that if someone is pulled over for a traffic citation, or they're arrested for something, they don't care what the charge was. They don't care if they got a citation or a warning. What they care is how that officer treated them if they allowed them to tell their story, if the officer acted as if they cared about that incident, if they treated them with dignity and respect. That's what matters. And that's what we put a great deal of emphasis on at the Tampa Police Department is focusing on that. And we do that in a lot of different ways. A lot of it is the training. We are very lucky to have, uh, Lori Fordell is a um, professor at USF, and she's going around the nation training on fair and impartial policing. And in essence, what she's saying is that every individual has biases. Every individual. There's no getting around that. And it's how you deal with those. One, ensuring that you realize you have them, you accept that, and then as far as law enforcement is concerned, you don't allow that to affect the way that you, that you police out in your community. And a lot of it has to do with officer safety as well. That if you assume this individual is the one committing crime and you're not paying attention to these individuals, then that can be a, a safety issue and clearly it can be a, a crime issue as well. Now, one of the things, again, with the public perception, uh, just to show of hands, how many people would you, now we handle close to 700, 800,000 calls for service a year at the Tampa Police Department. How many shootings, deadly force shootings, do you think Tampa Police Department gets in on average a year? Anybody? A hundred? One? Zero? Two hundred and fifty. Two hundred and fifty. Okay, so far this year at the Tampa Police Department, actually it's more than this, it was um, uh, June when I retired in May, but as of June, the Tampa Police Department had taken 600 firearms off the street. That means 600 people out there with guns on them with a potential deadly encounter, right? You're, you're dealing with an armed individual. We have zero, zero fatal encounters. The most that we ever had when I was the chief of police were four in one year, and it was either zero, one, or two uh, the other years that we had those. So officers, the perception quite often now with the public and in the media, fueled by the media, is that officers take the job of law enforcement to go out and kick ass, you know, to get a gun, to drive fast, and just to, you know, do whatever they want. The reality is police officers take that oath to serve and protect, to protect human life, to do the best they can to keep you from being a victim of crime. And the last thing they want to do is get in a deadly force encounter. 
I can tell you, I went to every police shooting that we had in the Tampa Police Department ever since I've been a staff member. And the first thing that the officers would say is it happened so fast. And the second thing was that I, I can't believe that, that I did that. I can't believe this has happened. I've seen grown men cry. I've seen them throw up. It's affected their lives when they've been put in a situation like that where they had to use deadly force. We do everything that we can to train and equip our officers to avoid that, you know, with less lethal tasers and those types of things. Uh, even pursuits. Pursuits are one of the most deadly um, uh, in tasks that a police officer can get involved in. And we have, in the Tampa Police Department over the last 11 years, reduced auto theft by 90%, 90% in our city. And pursuits are what I call a necessary evil. Because you don't want to, how can I explain to anyone's family that we were pursuing a stolen car and they ran a red light and killed your loved one? How can I justify if it was someone in my family, you, no one could ever justify that to me. So we do everything we can in the police department to avoid that. We get the helicopter up, follow the car, they think they're home free, they get out, we grab them. Uh, we pit, I tell all of the officers, I'll fix as many bumpers as we need to, just don't get in a pursuit, box them in, do everything that you can to avoid the pursuit. Same thing with deadly force issues. We train our officers in reality-based situations everything that we can to, to avoid those types of things. But still, the, the public perception is that officers are out there and are, are very, very trigger happy. One of the things I read, I don't know, I'm sure every one of you subscribes to Time Magazine, but I read and my son said, hey mom, did you read that article in Time Magazine about um, policing in America? And I said, you know, I started to and then I saw one of the graphics and I had to like take a, a break first. And it may not, if anybody saw it, it may not mean anything to you, but it's a lot of uh, information on law enforcement, public perception, how much officers make, demographic um, um, breakdowns. But uh, it says here, it has um, delineated by dots, that 72 police officers have been killed in the line of duty, while 601 citizens have been killed by police. And to me, and I may be, because I'm biased towards police officers, to me, that, that said that that should be an equal number there, that police officers should lose their lives as often as, as the criminals do. And, you know, I, I, just, I just can't um, buy that, but it's a very good article if you want to uh, read it about law enforcement and about different police officers, um, why they got into the profession and what they do, why they're out there risking their lives uh, every day for you to make sure that you're safe and in, um, in your homes. Now, with the things going on now, with the shootings and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and those types of things, clearly it's not lost on anyone that it goes much deeper than that. It goes much, much deeper to social issues that police officers aren't able to fix, educational, economic, those types of situations that, um, you know, that we can't fix. We are out there looking for the bad guys, simply, to make neighborhoods safer. And I'll give you uh, one statistic. There's actually a, a little op-ed in here by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he's talking about uh, Black Lives Matter and the importance of it. And he uses a, a couple of surveys that talk about uh, education department um, survey saying that students of color in public schools are punished more and receive less access than white students to experienced teachers. This leads to lower academic performance for minorities, putting them at greater risk of uh, dropping out of high school. They also are on the short end of the job market. Unemployment among blacks has doubled that of whites. And also a study that found that if an applicant has a black sounding name, that they're 50% less likely to get a call back. Now, all of that is true, but is that an issue of prejudice on the part of the teachers or uh, those employers in the job market, or does it go back to economic uh, issues, social issues that we need to look at as a country? And I believe it's the latter, but people don't want to, they want the quick fix, they want the easy answer, they want to say that black lives matter, but 
what for me that means is that Black Lives Matter when shot by a white police officer. We have, when I retired, 26 homicides in the city of Tampa. Two were white males, no, two, one was white male, two were Hispanic, and the rest were African Americans killed by other African Americans. And quite often I would talk to groups of students in the city of Tampa, and I would ask them to recite, uh, you know, the names of, does anybody know who Michael Brown is? Everybody knows that. And then I would say a name of someone in their neighborhood that had been killed, a young African American, and they didn't know those names. And I said, that life is just as important as anybody else's life. But nobody seems to be paying attention to those issues. But I don't want to take the, the focus away from police-involved shootings, because I think that's very, very important. A lot of people tell me, you've picked a great time to get out of law enforcement right now. You know, just when public perception of law enforcement is, is um, uh, becoming more and more negative by the day. But I disagree with that. I think this would be the perfect time to be in law enforcement, because law enforcement needs to change. We need to be more transparent. It's my view that the majority of citizens don't know and don't care what police officers do. They basically just say, keep the bad guys away from me, you know, don't let anybody steal my stuff and keep me safe. That's all I want, I don't want to know. Well now, in this day and age, more of the public is getting involved in law enforcement, learning what happens in law enforcement, and I think that's very good. I think law enforcement needs to be much, much more transparent than we, we have been in the past. And we've been doing that at the, at the uh, Tampa Police Department. We have twice a year, we have citizens academies, and we bring in adults, um, and I personally would recruit them, and I would bring in activists who you know, had no use for the police department whatsoever. I bring in a wide uh, variety of citizens from the community. And the first night, they look around like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here with all these people? And then by the end of the nine weeks, they found they had much more in common than differences, and they became fast friends. And they also got to learn a little bit about the police department. The one night that was most enjoyable for us was the use of force night, because we made the citizens the police officers, and the bottom line is, they shoot everybody. I mean, they, there's no questions, they just shoot everybody. The police officers are the bad guys, and we'll have them do traffic stops, and we'll get the heart beat, and they've got the lights on, you know, they're in the police car driving up behind them. The street's dark, they have to walk up to the car, not knowing what they're walking up on. And uh, the first move that the driver would make, they just back up and shoot him. And one of them, we had one, I asked her, I said, why did you shoot him? And she said, I told him to get out of the car twice. I said, no, you know, he really can't do that. But it just gives a new appreciation or an understanding of what, um, what, law, enforcement, what law enforcement officers go through. We also started a uh, Young Citizens Academy and we would have school resource officers pick those kids that were kind of on the edge, you know, that fork in the road and have them come. And the first night, you know, they would, I would talk to them and they go, have that look like I can't believe I was made to come here. And I recognize that look because I have two 16-year-olds myself. They give it to me quite often. But at the end of it, invariably we would have young men stand up and say that they had an interest in going into law enforcement. They had never had any exposure before except what they saw in the media. And so those are ways that we try to open up with the community and be much, much more transparent. We have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, open to ride loans. People can come in anytime they want and ride around with officers in any part of, of our community. And that's, um, that's very, very important. Now, again, with the, <clears throat> with the, um, the media and what's going on now in, in, uh, uh, with the media. I was having a, a conversation earlier about how media is changing, especially for uh, television news, print media, everything social media. You can get your news, breaking news 24-7 on your smartphone so people don't, except old people like me, don't need to read the newspapers anymore. And so there's a little bit of a, kind of a fight for survival, in my opinion. And so sometimes the, the uh, articles that are written in the paper are a little less than objective. There was an article that some of you may or may not have read uh, several months ago that the Tampa Bay Times did, 
and the uh, title of it, they actually, they didn't receive any complaints from citizens of Tampa. The article was written based on an article in Fort Lauderdale called Viking While Black. And they showed that African Americans received an inordinate number of Viking citations. Well, Tampa, Hillsborough County, is, um, I think number three in the nation for bicycle and pedestrian fatalities, and the state of Florida is number one. And we actually received grants to um, to look at biking safety and pedestrian safety to try to reduce those numbers. We also gave out hundreds of bike lights to individuals at night and actually installed those uh, bike lights on the, the specific bikes. But the just of the article was that we were giving many, many more of these biking citations to African Americans, which was true, but they also ignored the fact that the inordinate number of citations overall went to white motorists. But that wasn't interesting. And so the feedback that we got from the community, specifically Sulphur Springs and East Tampa, which are predominantly African American communities, was keep doing what you're doing. Our neighborhoods are very, very safe now. We can go outside, we can enjoy, we don't have to worry about our property being stolen. We can enjoy our neighborhoods again. But there were a couple of, of, of groups, actually, that surprised me. One was the NAACP, who I had a very, very close relationship with the president, Carolyn Collins, and she had just retired. Another individual showed up in my office and told me that she got at least a dozen complaints a day about officers um, harassing African Americans on their bicycles. And I said, really? I said, because Carolyn, she calls me on a regular basis about incidents and I look into those and we work together as a team to, you know, if the officers are wrong, we fix it, and if not, then we explain it. And um, I said, you know, how come I haven't heard about this? And she said, well, I guess that's my bad. And, you know, she indicated that she hadn't told uh, the police department about any of those problems. But anyway, again, that's something the way the media can, can uh, represent a situation and can take uh, information. Now, I'm not saying that there was no issue whatsoever in that, and we went back and looked at every single bicycle citation that we gave out to ensure that they were given out appropriately. But, um, you know, those are things that we look at. We also have, uh, we also have um, what's called civil citation. We, Karen Collins from the NAACP, approached me when I was the assistant chief of operations about the infinite number of arrests of African American students in Hillsborough County Public Schools. And so we looked at that and what we could do to try to address that issue. And we came up with a program called Civil Citations. And those are given out in instances of misdemeanor violations that really, when I was young, were just handled by your parents and the police were never called in. You know, a phrase, we always have to have a, a name for, you know, a different name. It's just a fight, your basic school fight. Simple batteries, those types of, of offenses that occurred most often on school grounds. And so the first time offense, kids would get a civil citation and they would, they would experience the theory that my father perfected when I was young and that, that was that punishment was swift and short. They would have to do um, community service right away, and if they, they successfully completed the community service and the other things that needed to be done, then they would never have a record, there would be no record of, of that, um, that charge. And that's been so successful that we've actually put that out into the community, and the number one charge out in the community for juveniles is shoplifting. So we now have a civil citation for shoplifting as well. So kids, you know, when they make mistakes that young kids make, they don't have that on their record if they try to get a job or they try to get into the armed services or those types of things. So again, trying to work with the community to do what we can to, one, to be transparent, and two, everything that we can to build upon those, those uh, relationships with, with the, uh, the community. And that's, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's very difficult when, oftentimes, when, uh, 
when you have the media portraying just one side of the issue. And it doesn't matter in those situations, whatever the report is, we always look at it, that particular incident, from top to bottom to see if there's any way that we can improve the way that we do that particular task. And you also have to think of it in law enforcement too. One of the things that attracts individuals to the field of law enforcement is that polite. You know, there's no set solution for a problem. No two problems are the same. You can go from changing floodlights for a widow in the middle of the night to a high-speed pursuit to arresting a, um, a serial killer. You know, it's never ever the same uh, two days in law enforcement. But on the other hand, you have to know everything. The statute books that we have are huge, and the officers are expected to know every single law, the ins and outs of that, and the changes in those laws. Every year we have to go through that as well with our officers uh, in training to make sure that, that, um, that they understand that and they don't do something that is, uh, is inappropriate. So it's not an easy job, but I can tell you for the people, police officers, I can say for me personally, that there was never a day in 31 years that I didn't want to go to work. I loved what I did. I loved going out there and helping people uh, every day. And that speaks for the majority of police officers. Now, if you have close to 700,000 people involved in a profession, you're going to have some bad apples out there. There's no doubt about it. And quite often, people would ask me, what's your opinion in these situations? The situation in New York, the situation in Ferguson. And I would tell them, I don't know, because I don't have all of the facts. For example, in Ferguson, my son asked me one day, well, what do you think, Mom? Was that police officer wrong or right? I said, I don't know, honey. I don't have all the facts. I said, what I do know is that everyone has made up their mind one way or the other, definitively, even though they don't have all the facts as well. And I said, and another thing I feel pretty certain of is that if that individual had followed the lawful orders of the police officer, it wouldn't have ended that way. That doesn't make the police officer right. That just makes the, the citizen in the encounter alive to be able to complain about the officer's actions in those types of, of incidents. Um, and I'll tell you something that's a little gender bias too. Uh, somebody told me a little bit to, you know, go for the, uh, the um, women's power and, and uh, uh, strong women being in positions of authority. One of the things when I was, was named as the chief of police, a great deal was made about me being the first female. And I said at the end of my tenure, I didn't want to be remembered as the first female police chief. I wanted to be remembered as a good chief. But in saying that, the significance of being the first woman was not lost on me. It was very, very important that I did a good job because I felt that if a man in my position failed, he would fail as an individual. If I failed, the response would be, see, I told you a woman couldn't do it. And a lot of people feel that women shouldn't really be involved in law enforcement. I think that's quite archaic, and women have proven their place in a lot of different um, professions. But I, I always ask, what when I do the, the Great American Teachings and things, I always ask, what's the most important tool that a police officer has? And it's either the gun or the taser is always the number one and two uh, answer. The reality is, it's your mouth. It's the ability to talk your way into or out of a situation. And who are better talkers than women, let's be honest. <laughs> That's the reality of it. And I've gotten in very, very few fights in those 31 years, and the majority of the knockdown, drag out fights I got in were caused by the male police officers that showed up as backup. Because the guys would be like, oh, well, go anywhere with you, baby, put those handcuffs on me, you know, whatever they want to make a joke or whatever. It's like, yeah, it's fine with me. And the next thing you know, the testosterone, the testosterone, and the rolling around on the ground. So, again, you have to look at those different. It goes back to perceptions. It goes back to, to uh, biases and uh, all of that. And that's why we need to continue training our officers and doing things differently. And I'll give one more example. I've got my mom's tendency to uh, ramble. I'll give one more example um, quickly about perception and uh, the change in law enforcement. We do something, you guys have all seen it on TV, 
you have somebody that commits a crime, violent crime, and the cop comes in and shows a photo back. You get, there's actually um, software that will, you'll get a picture of your suspect and then it'll kick out driver's license pictures that look just like that guy. You know, if you have a, the suspect's a white male with brown hair and a beard, then the other five guys have to have, be white males, brown hair and beard. Well, we have done that forever. But what is, has um, come out in recent research is that human perception is not nearly as good as we think it is. And that eyewitness testimony is probably the worst form of identification. And also, they have shown that the law enforcement officers, when they're showing those photo packs, Although they're not, you know, putting X's and stars and pointing at that's the suspect, that's the suspect. It's their case. They feel pretty confident that, that their guy is the, the suspect. And so there may be some unconscious indication that that's the right guy or pick that guy. So what we have gone through uh, with my contact with the Innocence Foundation is we have changed the way that we show photo packs. And now what we call it's blind double sequential. And it has to be somebody who knows nothing about the case. They don't even know if the, the suspect's picture is in the six photographs that they have. And they have to show the photos one at a time, individually, to the witness. And then the witness, if they can pick out a suspect, they pick out a suspect. And then they have to indicate per, by percentage how confident they are in the person that they have picked. Because again, people have been put on death row by uh, inaccurate witness testimony. So we're getting as far away from that as we can. But again, that's how law enforcement is evolving. It's not, it's not an exact science. It's certainly far from perfect. But I can tell you that most officers go out there every day trying to do the right thing out in the community. And a lot of the issues that we are talking about today in the media need to be talked about on a much larger scale and not to point to law enforcement as the bad guys. And if we can fix the bad officers in law enforcement, we won't have any more racism in our country. I don't think that anybody believes that. What will change that is fair, open, and honest dialogue. But I don't know if this country is ready for that. I know that the politicians aren't ready for that. I think that the, the individuals that are ready for that are all of you that are in this audience right here. Because you have grown up in a different environment than I grew up in. And I think that there is a much, much more um, acceptance for differences and actually an embracement of differences individual differences um, in our communities today. So with that said, I am going to give you a, um, a little advice, I guess, because again, I'm old and I've got two 16 year olds, so I'm fully qualified to give advice. But you have to be the one to change things. One, don't base your opinions on what other people say. Do your research, get the facts, and then develop your opinion based on that. Don't go with the crowd just because they, police officers are just as bad. You know, I always say, you don't let the facts get in the way of a good story, and most people are like that. And if they, a story is told three or four times, then by then they've got an eyewitness to the whole incident. Find out what the facts are, be your own person, and make up your, your uh, own opinion. And also get involved. I always, uh, with my boys, I always tell them, don't be the person that sits back and complains about things. Before you utter a complaint, try to fix that situation. No matter what it is, whether you're mentoring young kids, or you're running for office one day, or you're you know, trying to, to uh, change the uh, global pollution, doing something to improve your community, because you guys are the future of, of, um, of this community. You're it. You're going to be running it one day and you need to take that uh, responsibility very, very seriously. Now, some of the things that, um, you know, again, like I said, people say, well, this is a good time to be out of policing, and, and I don't think that's the case. I think that the, um, the future of policing, the negative side of it, is there's going to be more um, police officers that are shot. 
I think it, you guys saw in, in Texas the uh, officer that was ambushed, and we've had a, a, a huge spike in law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty. After three years ago, we had hit um, an all-time low since, I believe, the 50s. Uh, we had hit an all-time low in, in officer um, uh, deaths. But those are coming up. And also, it's going to result in more citizens challenging police officers' authority. What I always tell young people is, do what the officer tells you to do, and then if you have an issue, you feel that they were inappropriate, deal with that after the fact. That's um, the best approach to anything. But on the positive side of it, I again seeing the community, citizens getting more involved in policing, and I think that's very important, because we're out here working for you. Police officers work for the citizens. The uh, taxes pay our salary, and we're out here to, to keep your neighborhoods as safe as you want them uh, to be. And it's also going to cause police officers to focus more on the needs of communities and citizens and being much, much more uh, transparent. I said uh, four and a half years ago, I predicted that in five years, every police officer in the nation would have a body-worn camera on. And it didn't have anything to do with the police community relations, um, the, the rift in the police community relations that has come forward. It had more to deal with the technology and the fact that everybody has a cell phone. And there's just an expectation now that there's video of everything. You know, if there's not video, then somehow it didn't happen or the police officers aren't, um, aren't telling the truth. And police officers want the video cameras. We have 80 of them in our department now, and the officers, they enjoy uh, wearing those video cameras because it shows their interactions with the community every day. But it's very, very expensive endeavor at this point. I believe the prices will come down dramatically. But also what you need to remember, too, is that the video from these encounters is not going to be like the NFL playback. You know, you're not going to be able to see it from six different angles. Number one. Number two, it's not going to be pretty. I don't know how many of you in this uh, auditorium have been involved in a knock-down, drag-out fight for your life. It's not pretty. And it's not going to be pretty on video either. But there is going to be a lot of changes in law enforcement. There's going to be a lot more questioning, a lot more transparency. The Citizens Advisory Group that um, seems to turned into a power struggle between the mayor of Tampa and city council. That is something that we have looked at for several years in the police department. We try to look at all the ways that we can be transparent and bring the community in and get them involved. But as a chief of police, you have a finite amount of resources and you have an infinite number of requests, tasks, and mandates. And so you have to pick and choose what you can and can't do. And the reality of that citizen's advisory is that the police department is going to administer that. They're going to be responsible for the cost of it and the administration of it, which is fine. It's a good thing. Again, it makes the department more transparent. City of St. Petersburg has one. They had, after they had the riots in the, uh, the 90s, they implemented one. And the most common finding of their citizen's advisory, according to the St. Pete staff, is that the St. Pete Police Department disciplines their officers too harshly. So I think it will be an um, educational experience for the community to see how seriously police departments take complaints on their officers. Again, because the officers represent all other officers. Something else, and I'll open up to questions after this, something else that I tell my officers when I swear them in, and I said, from this day forward, you take that oath and you pin on the badge in the Tampa Police Department, from this day forward, you have lost your individuality. Because you represent a thousand other men and women that are wearing the Tampa Police Department uniform, and you had better make sure that your actions reflect positively on that uniform. And it's very important that they understand that, and they take it to heart every single day. The badge that the police officer wears carries a great deal of power. You have the power to take away somebody's freedom, and you have the power, in some cases, to take a life. 
And that can never be taken for granted. And that's something that we remind our officers of on a daily basis. All right, I'm going to open up for questions. Yes, sir. What is the training to be a Tampa police officer, I was just discussing that um, earlier. One of the things that we benefit from is that we, the majority of the officers that we hire come from other police departments. So we don't necessarily have to train them to be office, police officers, we just have to train them in the Tampa Police Department way. But in order to be a police officer at the Tampa Police Department, you have to have your certification. Back in the old days before cars were invented, when I became a police officer, we were actually hired and then put through the academy. Now you have to put yourself through an academy or you have to be sponsored. And that's something that I do. I use law enforcement, I keep talking like I'm the chief, I used uh, law enforcement trust funds to sponsor one or two classes a year that would have uh, minority and women candidates in them. It's about $5,000 to take this class. You go through the class, you get certified, and then you apply. You go through a very rigorous background because you think police officers, your driving record. If you have more than five citations, I'm not hiring you as a police officer because you get in a pursuit down the line and something happens, then I'm going to be liable for your actions, whether they're right or wrong. Uh, financially, make sure that you're not in debt, and you're, you're in, in situations where you're trusted with money, property, those types of things. Psychological exams, you go through a battery of those. Uh, physical testing, there's a, it's, it's about a six month process at its quickest to go through a, a, a background check. And then once you're hired, you have to go through a holdover, which is two months in our department, and then you start a training program, and that goes into a year of uh, probation, and you ride with a training officer in all three districts for a series of phases. So it's very difficult. To, we, we hire maybe, since we hire pre-certified, if it was all Applicants with no previous experience, we hire one or two per 100 applicants. And I would say we hire probably 10 per 100 applicants with the pre-certified. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, I have a couple of questions, but the one about this being, uh, uh, based on speed traps, uh, being No, it doesn't, and, and um, that's something, too, that we changed the way we police 10 years ago, and that's why we've been able to make this city as safe as it is. And, and every year, we run the police department like a business, and every year we looked at strategies and became more and more surgical. You know, if you're writing, for example, our traffic unit, one thing everybody thinks that police departments uh, gain revenue through traffic citations, that's, that's a misnomer. One, if a traffic citation is contested, it costs us a great deal of money because the officers have to go to court. If you pay your ticket straight out, Tampa Police Department gets $12 and 40 something cents for it. So it's, we have identified the highest, 20 highest accident intersections in the city where accidents, injuries, and property damage occur. And that's where our people are expected to do traffic enforcement. If they're running radar somewhere, it's based on a complaint or it's based on high incidence of traffic. We don't, we don't do that. Here's how many tickets we wrote for the day. And I don't believe in that. I know there's organizations that do. Matter of fact, one of my traffic guys, I was in the gym working out 
one of my own traffic guys, and he has a camera, and he was telling me about it, and he wrote a woman a, a ticket. He was just giving everybody warnings in the school zone, and this woman was like, just give me a ticket, I'm in a hurry. And he wrote her a citation, she was doing 50 some miles an hour through the, and she just grabbed it from him, brought it up, threw it on the floor, and peeled out again. And he said, um, you know, he's glad he had a camera because he would show that in court when she, when she, you know, hyperventilated and she found out it was 500 and some dollar citation down the road. But um, that I agree because that's a safety issue. And that's the only place I would agree with speed cameras is in school zones. Because you, know, you hit a little kid, that you're, you're not taking that back. But I don't believe in speed cameras. I believe in red light cameras. They've reduced the accidents and the injuries in the city of Tampa. And I had 18 traffic officers, and I can put them out in, in other areas. And again, we did our research and put them in the high accident intersections, not in the ones that the vendor thought they could make the most money in. But I agree with you on the speed traps, and that's ridiculous. Yes? Why did you decide to retire? Well, um, it's, uh, it's, they, they say the chief uh, job is like the NFL coach. You know, you can only do it for about five years before you're out. But I, I actually had to retire at 30 years, and the mayor kept me on contract. I promised him when he first came into office that I would stay for his first term. And um, he wanted me to stay another four years, but it was really someone else's, uh, someone else's opportunity to run. I felt like we had, we had really got the Tampa Police Department to a great position and let a younger team take it further. But I miss it. I love law enforcement. Yes? Have you noticed um, an increase in female applicants in the forces? The best recruiting tool is other police officers. And um, we, the national average in law enforcement for women is about 12%. In the Tampa Police Department, we have 16%. Uh, but we're always looking at, at recruiting women, minorities. We have a very high in the city of Tampa. St. Petersburg, not so much. Tampa, we have a very high Hispanic population. And so we, uh, we recruit very heavily in uh, Hispanic communities as well. But um, I, I the, there's a, a story a woman told me in the spring breakfast. She came up to me and she said, I just have to tell you this. She said, my nine-year-old daughter saw you on, on um, the news this morning. And she said, Mom, isn't that the police chief? And she said, yes, it is. And she goes, well, I can be anything I want to be. So that was nice. Yes, sir? What are cover officers drive certain eagles? Undercover? Yeah, I'll give you all the tags. Because the last thing you want to do is see them in your rear view. Yeah, we, uh, most of the cars that the undercover officers used were uh, seized from the bad guys, but uh, the bad guys got pretty smart and they started leasing all their cars and not buying them. And so um, now we have to go out and buy kind of jumper cars for officers. Cars are a huge, huge issue in law enforcement. We're supposed to turn our police cars over every seven years. And uh, now we're at nine. When I left, I had just got it down to nine from ten years. And that's a long time for a police car to be driven out there. Yes, sir. Yes, you do. That's not a rumor. That's a, that's a fact. And the reason that I, I require that is twofold. One, it hurts like hell. And you need to know that so you don't screw around with it. It's not a toy. It's a, it's a piece of equipment. So even, I got tased, and it is not enjoyable, I'll tell you that. And I'll also tell you the guy at University of Florida that said, don't tase me, bro, was not being tased because the only thing that you can utter while you're being tased is uh, cuss words. You can't actually put a sentence out, I know that. And the second reason was to show that it's safe that all of these officers are being tased because you see in the news where it says someone died from being tased. And there, there hasn't to date been a case where they can say the taser was the cause of death. It's usually they say the excited delirium where the, the individuals are in bad shape, high on drugs, and they're in this tussle. And then um, the, and I tell you what, the taser has saved so many lives, especially when you look at the incidents of mentally ill. The, the counselors for the mentally ill 
in this day and age are police officers. The mental health facilities are the jails because there's, it's, it's, um, it's a very, very sad state of affairs and um, we have been able to save a lot of lives by taking someone into custody with a taser as opposed to having to use deadly force, which I think is wonderful. Yes, sir. That's the majority of the involvement of undercover officers. 
but they're not supposed to be getting in pursuits. It has to be extenuating circumstances. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> Cops tend to speed sometimes too. They have. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, out of the cars that you guys seize, which ones go into the like, Well, if they're, um, you guys might have seen in the paper, the, the mayor was driving what he called the pimp mobile. We had a guy that we had arrested for human trafficking and prostitution. And we got his um, suburban, so the, the mayor was driving around in that. And it had the, the, I don't know what it is, you guys might know, the mufflers. You know, when they put that muffler to make it sound more like a Harley Davidson. So that impressed his daughters. But if it's a very expensive car, we sell it, and then we use that money to buy two more economical, Less flashy after a couple of dollars for them. Go ahead. Um, what inspired you to become a police officer? Well, I'm kind of sorry you asked that question now because I don't have like a tear drinking Hallmark story for that. I, um, I went to school on an athletic scholarship. Uh, I grew up with all boys, so I became a pretty good basketball player. And uh, the fact that I was six foot in the second grade didn't hurt either. And uh, people used to always say, remember when you rode the school bus and your feet wouldn't touch the ground? I said, no. But anyway, I went through uh, college on an athletic scholarship, which was really the key to, to open all the doors for me. And I had aspirations of going into the federal service, uh, secret service FBI, but Reagan was a president who put a freeze on federal hiring. And I had some friends from the University of Tampa that had gone to the Tampa Police Department, and they said, you should try this out. And I had never gone on a ride along or anything else. So again, I feel very blessed to have found a profession that I really had passion for. And um, you know, to this day, and I hope that for each and every one of you, find your passion in life. Don't do, you know, if your parents want you to go into law or medicine and it's not in your heart, don't do it. Find out what your passion is. You'll be much more successful and you'll be much happier. And I was fortunate enough to find that um, for myself. And I think that's the last question. Thank you all very much. Chief Pastor, we'd really love to thank you again for uh, coming here, not only for your, your public service that you that you uh, committed your life to like that, um, and especially though encouraging us to think about. Uh, empathy and underlying the root causes of some of these problems when sometimes the police and the community comes into conflict. The problems are much more deep than that than the media often portrays. It's a great reminder for all of us to use our heads and to think and ask, ask about the, the issues. So um, again, thank you so much. Thank you for coming here. We have a small token here of our appreciation. It's our first Willis Lecture. We'd also like to uh, thank the Willis family for sponsoring and supporting this lecture series, folks. So please give them a hand.